Greetings, race community. Brent coming in live with today's guest, Jonah Nye, who serves as Senior Vice President of Development and Alumni Engagement at The New School. Welcome, Jonah. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I've been looking forward to this conversation. My understanding is that we have a lot of things in common, including a love of music and baking and uh, a whole yeah, bunch that's of right. things. That's right. But uh, most important, uh, a shared interest in uh, in fundraising and the advancement world more broadly. And so I look forward to learning more about your story. I love finding out from my guests just um, kind of what your own path to higher education was. So uh, I often ask, you know, take me back to your junior year of high school. Who was that Jonah? Uh, what was he up to and what led him to Lawrence University? Uh, he looked exactly the same. I am ageless. No, I'm just kidding. I have pictures to prove that that is not true at all. But uh, no, I would say a 16 year old me or 17, whatever that was. Um, I had a one track mind Mac when I was in high school. I knew I wanted to sing opera, which is sort of unusual, right? So my first professional gig was when I was um, about 16 or 17. And it was a fluke. A voice teacher took me to one of her auditions and, and they ended up having a small role for me. Um, and it was a strange role. What was that? Can I ask a quick question? Yes. How does one discover whether that might even be a possibility, right? Like there is a sing in the car, sing in the shower vibe that a lot of people have, but how do you even know? Like, when do you first yeah. <laughs> get that aspiration? What you know, it was, um, I kind of wonder if I've got what it takes. That's not really why I'm asking though. Oh yeah, exactly. If you would like to audition for the Met Opera, I know some people, I can set you up. But um, yeah, so no, you know, in fourth or fifth grade or whatever, they make you pick an instrument. Uh, my sister was a violinist um, and professionally later too. And so my mom was like, pick something else. So I p and pick something that's inexpensive. <laughs> so I picked the voice because that didn't cost anything at the time. Um, I, it later catches up to you. I, could, I had the student loans uh, later to prove it. But so I sang and took lessons. And then this teacher, you know, took me to one of her opera auditions to sort of expose me. I had never seen an opera um, or or anything like that. I didn't even know what one was. And um, they thought it would be a good learning experience for me to sing something for them, get some feedback, and then go on my merry way. And they have, were doing a show uh, by Ravel called L'Enfant Les Sotilèges. There is a role in there, a Chinese teapot, which uh, it's really funny. I mean, I'm Korean and Japanese, so, you know, huge acting stretch. But it was a very tiny role. I could sing the notes. It was sort of high. Um, and so they had me do it. And then I, I was kind of hooked on it. And so... I figured higher education would just serve a very technical purpose in my life, you know, classical music training. So I made the rounds and auditions of various places. Uh, but the one that offered the most competitive financial aid package was a liberal arts college, a very small one in Wisconsin that had a music conservatory for undergrads. And that was Lawrence University. And that's and, an and I meant to ask Jonah, where were you um, at this moment in where was high school? Um, both Minnesota and Virginia. I moved uh, my senior year, but both areas ha have really rich, uh, great public um, educations and music, you know, both have music theory and good teachers, and they're around universities, uh, and both have a very strong history of choral singing. So there was always a lot of singers around. Um, and then DC had some competitions, you know, that I would do in high school for young singers that would build up scholarship funds and all that. Um, you know, but I went to Lawrence. I'd never been there. I did a regional audition in Washington, D.C. because I couldn't afford to fly out there. So I signed up for the school, never having seen it. And just because my financial circumstances dictated my choice. Um, and honestly, my entire freshman year, I was really crabby about it. I mean, I because I had gotten into some music conservatories in New York and where else. And I, I felt like, why do I have to read Plato? <laughs> why do I have to read, you know, As They Lay Dying by Faulkner? You know, we used to call it As I Die Reading. You know, everything felt like a waste of time. Statistics, all that stuff. Um, you know, I ended up really enjoying it and realizing it did set me up very well for grad school, which was a conservatory um, at New England Conservatory. And when I was there, I really realized how lucky I had been to have a broad range of study from, you know, really solid grounding in foreign language, um, opportunity to try stuff 
in a smaller stage, Appleton, Wisconsin is a very safe <laughs> place. You're not going to be reviewed by the New York Times or anything like that. Um, and just get a broader perspective of the world. So that, those were my two um, first higher ed experiences. And then mm -hmm. I had a surgery on my vocal cords when I was 26 and had to really lean on the professors and the career services department of my undergrad um, because I had such personal relationships with them. It was tiny. You know, we were a class of 300 students. My French literature class was four people. So I got to know all these people. And so when I really needed help and didn't know what to do, they still remembered me um, and sort of came to my rescue. But you actually, I mean, you were performing as an opera singer throughout that period. What were some of the most memorable performances, like when you think back to some of the experiences that really stand out? Um, actually, the one that was the most meaningful um, was not opera. It was the first anniversary of 9-11. So um, uh, the late Senator Kennedy's office had reached out to New England Conservatory. They needed someone to sing um, something uh, in Faneuil Hall and sort of recognizing the families from Boston that were killed. And so I did that. And I thankfully didn't realize how big it was going to be. I was just told it was going to be just for the families of this very private thing, but it was on. T it ended up being on TV and stuff. Um, so that one was, I think, the most meaningful, and that one is sort of shows what the power of music can do, you know, in terms of healing and bringing community together. Um, in terms of really fun ones, um, I would say the Aspen Music Festival um, was very fun, but very hard to sing in because the altitude and it's a desert. So if you're a wind instrument or a singer or a runner or any of those things, Aspen's actually not that fun <laughs> but, um, or to get to acclimate to. But I'd say those two are really, you know, really memorable and special to me. And so you you have this sort of forced career pivot yeah. by way of the, the surgery are then seeking guidance and perspective on where do I go from here? Um, where did you land? I mean, how did you start to kind of find the next, the next chapter? Yeah, I took a detour. I trained to be a sommelier for a second in California, um, which was really fun. Uh, but I, what was your favorite wine or two, uh, that everybody should, should um, know about? You know, the I actually, during my test, I asked one of the master sommeliers, yes, it is pretentious. It is as pretentious as it sounds. They like wear funny outfits and pins and ribbons and stuff. Um, and I asked like, what's your go-to? And I said, I expected it to be like Bordeaux or, you know, Pinot Noir or something really expensive. And they said, dry Riesling. It goes with everything. It goes with your takeout food that's really spicy. It can go on its own. So I actually, a super dry Riesling is the best. Um, and then, um, yeah, because if if you need something strong, that's when you just sort of skip to scotch. Um, so anyway, <laughs> I, I did the sommelier thing. Those were not my people. Those were nighttime people. I just want to sit down at night. So I reached out to career services at my undergrad where I had done a work study job for sophomore, junior, and senior year. So my job there for 6.15 an hour, to give you a sense of how old I am, um, was helping people write resumes and prepare for job interviews. And so I had strong relationships there. They helped me prepare to pivot and um, showcase writing skills. And so then I ended up doing an internship at the Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts of Massachusetts. And I got lucky, the first grant proposal I filled out, we got. And so then I was just said, people told me then, oh, you're a grant writer. And that was my first job. And I moved to New York, briefly did booking agent, but then went back to grant writing and I hated it. Um, I really, grant writing for me, uh, and sometimes it still feels like it for me, feels like doing my taxes over and over again. And I my framework for thinking about how organizations work is very much uh, in a musical vein. So I think there are piano people <laughs> or violin people like my sister who don't mind being alone in a room for eight hours to or 10 hours a day thinking on a task that has a beginning, middle and end. And then there are singers who always find themselves downstage center in the spotlight. And it took until 2008 when the when that recession happened and I was handed the annual fund portfolio at the place I was working that suddenly I realized, oh my gosh, you can just you can get paid to just talk to people. <laughs> so 
that was a turning point for me. And I was like, oh, I do like development. I was just in the wrong lane. And so you got into the lane, not only the the lane, but in a vertical that you knew a lot about at Opera yeah. America. Yes. And so yeah. that is kind of like the perfect confluence of you've lived the mission, you love it, you can speak to it authentically, you can sing to it if you have to. And yeah, uh, yeah. and also, you know, learning the, the craft of, of uh, in that case, annual giving. So just tell me about kind of what, what, when it clicked, why it clicked, sort of what, what you think back on in that experience. Well, you know, like anything, you know, you're in the zone when it, you don't realize you're working or time kind of passes. And yeah, talking to donors and squaring interests about what I already cared about, music and um, performance and opera. Um, I just knew I'd hit my sweet spot. And I think my work as a booking agent and in sales for, you know, wine and stuff like that, I'm like, oh, this is just the same. You know, asking people for money is the same however you want to do it, whatever it's for, whatever your portfolio is, the actual act of it, the the process of it, the setup, the pitch. So that felt fine. I didn't, I wasn't scared about that because there's a sort of performance aspect to it anyway, I think about frontlining. Um, but I did, ha- I knew I had to leave Opera America because it's a small place and the major gifts and the principal gifts were going to be raised by, you know, the CEO as appropriate. Um, so I chose to go to Columbia where, you know, I wasn't, I didn't go to Columbia or anything like that, but I knew that you've got this multi-billion dollar enterprise. You're going to get tons of training and help. They're not going to let you screw up. And it's all about volume. So a hundred, 120, 140 times a year going out. So at Columbia, I, I feel like for fundraising, it's like an instrument. I had some natural talent that I got to exercise at my first couple jobs, but then I learned my technique at Columbia. So you feel like they really did deliver on that expectation you had of, of this is going to be a great training ground for the profession of development. Absolutely. You know, I got to, my first job was at the school of the arts. So the content didn't feel, you know, scary or anything like that. Um, but it was broader and it was in the confines of a big complex machine. And then my second job there, when I moved to major gifts was at the journalism school, also a small shop, but slightly bigger, um, and just a very different style of fundraising. And I will, I still think that investigative journalists are some of the best fundraising partners I've ever had. They know how to interview. Like one of the things we did at the journalism school, um, we were asked to sit in on classes so we could understand better what we were selling. And the class I chose, two classes I chose were um, business journalism because it sounded boring to me, but I knew the professor was a huge opera fan, Jim Stewart, who is you know the head business writer for the New York Times. And he's great and entertaining and really changed the way I think about business journalism, how they're really dramatic stories, especially if they're family businesses that are getting profiled. I think of succession, you know, all the drama that comes in a family business. And then um, the art of interviewing with Nick Lemon. And I started stealing some of those frameworks for how I would do discovery meetings, because I'm like, this is exactly the same. This is why so many of the journalists were good fundraisers. So for all of the development officers and fundraising professionals that are listening, that aren't going to get to shadow those two classes. Yeah. The cliff notes of like one or two takeaways that that really changed your work. Um, there was a student working on a very, very difficult and emotionally charged uh, documentary in the art of interviewing class. Um, she was working, she was interviewing people who had committed really, really heinous crimes. And she was having trouble breaking them down and getting information. And um, they would ask her personal things and she felt very uncomfortable talking about herself, right? You know, a good journalist, you know, the old school is like, you know, you don't, the story's not about you. Um, And Nick said, don't forget that this is not a social occasion. This is an exchange of information. And so to the extent that you're comfortable, if you give a little bit of information, then you have the right to get something back. And so, you know, one, so I changed that technique a little bit um, for frontlining. Um, for an example, if I don't understand how someone's family philanthropy works, I'll start and I'll say, you know, when my husband gives to his alma mater, he cheats and he gives me a little credit in the annual listing. And he always says it's 
Patrick and Jonah are donors to UPenn or something. How does your family work? I know every family is different. And because I've exchanged, you know, a piece of information, I don't want to make it all sound cloak and dagger, but of course it's a trust building moment. Like why should they tell you anything if you aren't able to reveal something about yourself? And it doesn't have to be something that's so personal. It's just, this is how generosity and money and um, philanthropy works in my family. How about yours? I love that example, Joan. And I think it it can be, you know, certainly um, the the dynamic of, you know, interrogating someone versus yeah. really conversing with someone. There's some nuance there. Yeah. And there's cross-cultural elements, which I, I hope somebody writes a book one day because, uh, you know, I've been fortunate to work with um, a lot of international philanthropists and, you know, without resorting to stereotypes, the way you do it in France is going to be really different than how you do it in Asia, really different than how you do it in South America. So I actually have not had that conversation with enough of our guests. So without resorting to stereotypes, yeah. the broad brush, at least thematic differences that you've, you've felt personally. Um, the discovery meeting, you need to know your set of rules. You need to consult with someone who understands the culture going in because you will, um, money is such a hot, it's such a sensitive topic around the world. You know, some cultures just don't talk about it and some, and some do. Uh, What are the two extremes that you've experienced? Like, yeah. I have never been able to get to an ask faster than with Israeli donors. In fact, it would have been rude of me if I had sat down and been like, oh, how many children do you have? This is a nice office. If I had done that sort of the basic act one rapport building section, if I had not gotten to business right away, it would have been rude. It would have been seen as a time waste. You know, I joke that, um, look, New Yorkers we're like, we're barbarians. I mean, when we, when we talk about money all the time, how much did that cost? How much did your salad cost at lunch? Like we have no qualms about it, um, but that is just not true even in this country. And, but um, with the Israeli donors I worked with, it's like, you better get to business. I mean, I worked with somebody who, as she was sitting down said, what do you want? We had not even gotten our coffee order in. So, I mean, that is jarring, especially for your partners. If you're taking like, you know, in that case, a curator or somebody who's not in the fundraising game, they see it as an affront or that you've somehow offended. And it's actually like, no, that's not offensive. They're just getting to business. Whereas um, maybe in um, Asia, either, I'm trying to think, you know, the Chinese donors I've worked with, it's, it is an exchange, right? So if you're, if you're, um, history of money and framework for money and economy is communist or something like that. But the notion of philanthropy is pretty uniquely American. And so sometimes you have to do some explaining or just, you know, what are you getting is a lot of the questions I would get. Like, what am I, what do I get for this million dollars? And it's not being rude. It's just the understanding of why would I just give you a million dollars? Certainly my name must go somewhere. So then I just have to change the way I think about it. It's like, this is more like corporate. This is more like an American corporate ask where it's like, oh, here are the list of benefits. Here are the things that we can promise you. Here are the things we cannot promise you. Um, So it's just knowing those sort of rules of engagement. France, it's like, you better do that chit chat for 45 minutes. (laughs) Have you heard, I don't know, with other peers maybe, I mean, this to me is kind of where the uh, the blooper reel of advancement could be developed if people go in too hot or too cold. Oh, my God. Yes. I mean, have you heard any kind of yes. kind of stand out? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, well, I, I kind of stuck my foot in this, not in philanthropy, but it's the same principle. When I was in Japan, I casually complimented something that was in my room. And then the ne- it was like a jar of Japanese plums and they were good. So I, I told the host, I'm like, those are great. And then I left for the day and then I came back and my room was full of them as gifts. And I've heard about, you know, when you do business in China, a lot of times you better not compliment that, you know, pencil or pen or something. Cause that's like a subtle hint to, Oh, I want it. You know, so then you might end up with one and then you feel kind of ashamed for insinuating that you would like something in return just for the sheer joy of your presence. Um, so it's you can absolutely and, and you need to 
you have to be sensitive to that um, going into those. Con- I mean, you have to be sensitive whenever you talk to somebody about money. But then if you don't, if you're not from their culture and you haven't done the homework, then you could just really you could really represent your organization poorly. What led to the opportunity at the Jewish Museum? Um, a call actually from who ended up being my boss. She just saw me on LinkedIn and, um, wow. yeah. And I was like, huh, I don't know. I mean, I had been there. Um, and I thought it was interesting just because, you know, my own personal background, my mom has a Russian and Jewish background. I'm adopted. So I was like, okay, well, if I end up there, half my family is going to be like, amazing. You know, it's a miracle. He ended up back with the family. So I, I interviewed and, um, I really, really liked my boss, you know, and sometimes I think it can be for me, I I feel like your relationship with your boss has a disproportionate effect on your, you know, happiness in life. And so I was like, I like this person. Um, I like what she's about just in terms of values. I think other things I knew about her, um, you know, just from doing homework. Uh, I I just want to ask on that because I feel like in this sector where it is, it's, it's, so often it's about the mission and the pursuit of the mission and the mission and the mission that you forget or it, it, it the just I want a great boss yeah sort of understated r- relative to the way you just described it the functionality I figure the function well two things the functionality of my role is going to be the same everywhere so there's no huge mystery of that piece the second piece is I have worked at places where in terms of personal interest, I thought this is a slam dunk. This is perfect on paper. But um, I will say this is this is somewhat controversial. I've said this to my current boss, who's the president of the new school. I'm not an institutionalist by nature. I think institutions are groups of people doing their jobs together. And those configurations change over time and they can mean they can be great one moment and they can be toxic another moment. And so, yes, the mission of an institution is really important, but to your daily happiness, uh, the people around you are going to have the effect, right? So if I'm if I'm with people who don't make me happy, but I get to sell classical music, for me personally, that's not going to be enough. So um, I just, I really liked this person. Also, she gave me my first opportunity to manage a team. And... You know, I've heard horror stories about management. I had heard horror stories. I'd heard great stories. I thought, well, I I won't know till I know. (laughs) So this person's willing to take a leap of faith because I had been sort of doing the lone wolf jobs of having a portfolio, going out, bringing back some gifts, then going out again. And I could see an expiration date for me for that kind of work anyway, so that this opportunity came up. I thought let's let's try it. And was team leadership natural? Did it click management or uh, was it a learning curve? Um, I think some of it was natural. Um, you know, I'm a generally a cheerleader and very high energy and you know, like group things and group projects and you know, getting up in everyone's business, um, celebrating people's wins. So I think um again also because of my training as a musician, I had coaches all growing up, you know, along the way, helping me do stuff um, and giving me critique and me being in a position to hear the critique and accept it. So I think um, that part was natural to me. I think the things that were not natural to me were some of like the corrective conversations that have to happen along the way, no matter how good your team is. How do you do those um, within a legal framework? Like there's just, there's, technicalities to management that I didn't know that I had to get trained on, but the essence of it, helping people um, achieve something uh, together, that was, that wasn't something I think I had to learn. I think that was natural to it. And, uh, and then ultimately what led to the opportunity that you're currently uh, pursuing at the new school, which is the SVP for development and alumni engagement. Uh, a recruit again, a recruiter reached out. And so, you know, the first thing I do with that is I look at the people who sat in the chair before. And, you know, it's interesting. So I, I knew the recruiter. This was somebody who had um, I had known professionally in a different role. So I trusted her. So that was big. I was like, I don't know. I mean, I of course, I knew what the new school was, much like the Jewish Museum. I was like, huh, I didn't I didn't think about that opportunity. Um, 
so I looked at the people who had sat in this chair before me and I, you know, to be honest, I said, I don't think, I don't think I'm what you're looking for. A very different background, just like very different, I think, just life, you know, lived experience. So I said, I really don't want to be the wild card candidate. I know that firms have to do that and have like a really broad array, certainly, you know, diverse candidates. I said, but I just, I don't want to play that role in this search. Thank you very much. And this person said, look again, look at what they're trying to accomplish. Look at the leadership, the cabinet, what they're trying to accomplish. And so, I mean, kind of like my other story, um, I was like, well, this Dwight McBride person seems interesting. <laughs> and then I started reading some of his books and I really liked them. Um, I thought, uh, here's a visionary and vision, big ideas. I know it's trite, but big ideas attract big philanthropy. And this was a man who wrote, I think in the nineties or early two thousands, a book called why I hate Abercrombie and Fitch, which surfaced really like stuff we take for granted now to talk about sexuality, race, the intersectionality of it, um, white supremacy, stuff that's in the news all the time now, but he was writing about it at a time when it really wasn't accepted. And I thought, okay, well, here's a visionary. So that's interesting. So he's probably got some other radical and progressive um, ideas that he wants out in the world. And I think I can, I think I can work with that. So that was, that was the hook for me. I love that. And, and it's so you know, similar to what you just said, it's not necessarily about <clears throat> the mission of a given institution. It is about the leadership and is it a vision for this moment? Like the mission might stay the same for a hundred years, but yes. is the near-term vision something that I can get aligned with where I feel uniquely positioned to help? Yeah, and I, I I agree that people should stand in their principles and that the principles of the new school are rooted in, historically in social justice and progressive values and inclusion. But those words change over time. You know, like what was progressive 100 years ago is conservative now. And so I needed to make sure that my boss, the president of the university, um, that his vision, his definitions of what those words meant were the same as what they mean to me. Um, and again, why I go back to saying like, you know, yes, I'm proud of new school as an institution, but again, the people who have worked at this institution and have taught here have changed so much over time um, that I needed to look at it in the context that I would be coming in. So you've mentioned sales a couple of times and, and you know, you could say, okay, the president is going to set the, the top of funnel marketing narrative, right? The broad brush vision we've got to translate that into opportunities and revenue, right? And so how, how do you see that partnership of, of president sort of helping warm up the community or op help open doors while obviously having to be very selective about when they tactically would get involved? Yeah. Um, well, I think what's nice is I still consider him somewhat of a new president because he started just a few, like a week before uh, the COVID shutdowns. So, you know, he didn't really have the normal tour of duty with all the alumni hubs and stuff like that in his first year. Um, I would say, I think of our development team, and I said this to faculty as well, is like, we're kind of like the people who do the valuation of the, of the plans. So I am happy to sit and listen and at the meetings about academic vision and curriculum ideas and stuff like that. But then once the plan's been written or once the goals or the strategies have been discussed and articulated, then my team comes in. We look under the hood and what our special power is like, well, we, I said this to a professor who was trying to sell me something <laughs> to, to fundraise for. And I said, I'm not an ATM. <laughs> I do not conjure, you know, generosity out of thin air. I follow it. And I can tell you what philanthropists are interested right now in New York. So that's what I can do for you. So I can look at your list of priorities and they're all great, but I can tell you the winds are blowing in this direction, you know, projects related to climate justice, projects related to, you know, diversity initiatives, you know, the, those things change over time, but those are like what 
are the topics du jour. Tell me more about that dynamic though. Like what does a professor asking you to ask someone else for money, like what, what is that process? I mean, how formal is that sort of feedback cycle and prioritization, you know? Yeah, I think it depends. I'm not comfortable with um, meeting with, you know, ad hoc faculty to talk about their projects in that I don't want to give anyone hope that that will ultimately be what my team's working on. I feel like that's disingenuous. I love meeting with faculty just because they're interesting. And, I, you know, to see anyone excel and do something um, the best in their class is great. But I also don't want to give the impression that I can just run around and raise money for projects X, Y, and Z. And so the faculty I meet, you know, I try to be very clear and say, my priorities are out in plain sight. It's the budget. That's what I'm working against. And so if you're pro if you want to talk about academic vision and curriculum change, talk to your dean. And then if a dean comes to me, I say, if this is about academic vision or projects, talk to your provost. <laughs> now, when the provost and the president, you know, start talking to me about stuff, that's a little different. Or when the finances, like we have this, you know, current use gap that we need to fill in the budget. That's that's my list of priorities. Um, and I think just meeting with faculty all day to hear about all the amazing things they're working on actually gives false hope. And I actually, I, 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 it's like akin to lying, I think, to some of them to think that, oh, great, that is a worthy cause because it's not, that's not my job. My job is not to determine the merits of the worth of the work that they are doing. They have to hash that out through their own processes, through their own, you know, um, senates and stuff like that. My job is to um, fulfill I'm kind of like, you know, what's in the budget? Then I go and I do that. We often ask uh, our guests if there are gifts that they're particularly proud of or that are particularly memorable. And sometimes we get these off the wall, you know, million dollar this or or a really funny, unique experience. You um, in, in our pre-podcast questionnaire shared that you're proudest of the gifts that were the hardest to close. And I love that answer. And I would love to just, you know, whether it's specifics or in general, why that is your answer. And, and if there are, if there are gifts that, that you actually would have said, these are, these are probably not going to come in that you were able to kind of flip to the, to the positive. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Cause the, for me, the biggest were not my hardest, you know, and I, I try to talk about that with my team too, that there's a difference between performance and results. Like I knew a fundraiser who's uh who got a cold call from someone who had just won the lottery they literally won the lottery and didn't know what to do with all their money and so you know she helped him uh work on that and that was probably her biggest gift that year and I was like that's a great result also <laughs> if she had been at lunch and that phone call had been kicked over to my phone I would have service that gift. And that's not, I don't, I can't take credit for that. So my, my sort of self-worth on the job is not related necessarily to the number. So the gifts, um, one of the gifts that I'm really proud of is I met to see this legendary philanthropist at his house. And this is what he does now. He sits and takes meetings with people like me all day. I pitched him hard. He's like, absolutely not. He's like, I'm not going to fund that. Like he cut me off like mid sentence. Um, and so, you know, again, I tell my team, I have three plans going in. Plan A, multi-year, so you don't have to harass them repeatedly. Plan B, a one-timer, ad hoc. And then plan C, if it's really going south, don't beg. <laughs> have some dignity. Leave with your dignity. But get leads. And so I had to quickly go to plan C with this person and say, you being you, you must know people who are interested in this work and you can, I'm sure you can point me in the direction of someone who wants to be helpful. He said, I will give you five names. <laughs> you can tell them I told the call, but that's it. That's all I'm doing for you. I said, great, thank you very much. I then proceeded to get lost in his house. True story. I, it was so big that I actually got lost and had to perhaps have him help me exit this mansion. Um, so I'm not sure I made a great impression <laughs> on this person, but he gave me five names. I followed up with all of them. One of them said, sure, I'll take the meeting. 
I met, I brought a fancy dean with me, liked the idea, then that dean quit. <laughs> so then I had to wait. And this, you know, donor rightfully said, I need to see if this is a priority to your next one. So I had to keep this person warm for a long period of time. And then it took me 17 more touches to try to get the second meeting. And I tell also my staff, the second meeting is harder to get than the first. We're always proud of getting that discovery meeting. And then people are, there's a, there's a lot of people who say, don't ask on the first meeting. I totally disagree because these are incredibly busy people with complex lives. And if you've done your job right, they know what your roles and responsibilities are. And I don't believe in wasting people's time or pretending to build a relationship on something that is, is not related to the institution. Um, so I'm all about the first meeting if it's taken that long. So the second meeting did take, and I, I remember saying to this person's assistant who was very good at her job, at <laughs> keeping people like me at bay, uh, I said, you know, I'm either going to get, or at one point I said, this is your weekly call from Jonah. At this point, I think we're looking at either a restraining order <laughs> or a meeting. I hope it's a meeting. <laughs> And she finally caved, gave me the 30 minutes, and then we got the gift. So that's incredible, Jonah. Um, two things stand out. One is plan C. Yeah. What point in your career? I mean, that is so obvious in a certain sense. And I bet nobody does it. Honestly, I think most people don't have a great plan B. Plan C is your Hail Mary. Like, I got to leave here with something for my contact report. <laughs> you know, like, I think most people, the plan B is not great. Um, and I think that one's also a little bit trickier, too. But um, the plan C one, um, again, the, I think the common wisdom is like, well, if they don't give to Project X, none of their peers are. And that's, I don't know, that's just not been true for me. It just didn't align with their interests at that one particular moment in time. It doesn't mean that ha has any bearing on what their friends are working on right now. Um, and you don't know until you meet them. I met somebody who on paper, I was like, oh, he's all about Baroque music. And then I met him and found out that is true. Also, ultimate fighting. No matter how good your researchers are, that's not going to show up. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't have you know a nonprofit set up for ultimate fighting, but you know, just to say, people are so uh, complex, and that's what I love about this job is like you just you don't know what's going to happen on those meetings. Something surprises me every single time. Seventeen touches. Mm. We've got some data that suggests it takes between six and seven touches to get a meeting or, or to get a, you know, to get a, a no as well. Um, but most fundraisers, you know, twice is good. Three is great. You know, four is kind of crazy to be, you know, right now that much. And five is just off the kind of off the scale. So how do you balance that? Um, yeah, that one, I felt I had some running room because I had already gotten interest on the project with a different leader. So I wasn't unknown. Would I do 17 on a totally silent prospect? No, that's crazy. Um, and I, you know, I don't have that kind of time. Um, I call it like the, <laughs> like the Shen Yun version of marketing. Like I wish I had the marketing budget of that Chinese dance company. You see those billboards everywhere and they just like flood whatever region they're in. I don't have that kind of budget or time or bandwidth. Um, but for that one, I was certain. I was certain if I could get back in the room with this other leader who was equally impressive that we could get the deal done. And I knew that the assist and also I felt like the assistant, you know, if she truly thought this is not going to work out, she just would have ignored me. So, but no, I don't, that's not like a rule I try. <laughs> that was a very special case. The Jonah Nye 17 touch point. Yeah, you <laughs> haven't tried until you, yeah, you yeah. haven't tried until you've, you know, gone to their house and stood outside of their door stoop. I think that's partly the booking agent world. The booking agent world is a lot more aggressive. And um, there's, that's sort of in my DNA too. Fair enough. Um, we also asked you something that you're you're proud of having worked on recently, and you wrote, 
advancing a culture of equity, inclusion, and social justice. Tell me more about that. Uh, yeah. And kind of also, you know, in general and in, in your personal experience, but then really um, at the intersection of, of, of that topic in this sector of advancement. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I worry about most for our field is not the, you know, amount of resources out there or, or people's willingness to be gener generous. I know there's a lot of headlines right now about like a generosity crisis, but I don't, I feel like those are sort of breathless, not very nuanced headlines. The thing I worry about the most actually is the lack of diversity in our field. So we're not making progress. We just aren't, you know. Um, I remember being at a big fundraising sort of cattle call at Columbia when I worked there. They brought the 100 or 140 or so of us frontliners together monthly. I saw one other Asian person and I said to her, where are the Asians? Wait, are we the Asians? And then I said to her, you know what? In half a generation, this will be better. And then 11 years later, she and I were on a Zoom with about 80 or 90 fundraisers from around the country. And there were three me, her, and one other person who I also knew. So I'm like, okay, so this is not just going to correct itself. And now that I'm in this position, I'm going to have to do something about it. Um, you know, as of 2019, 83% of frontliners are white. And there's a lot of reasons why. So um, anyway, we partner at the new school with EAB, uh, the consulting firm. And I asked that for our retreat, we kind of skip the normal intros and let's make it content rich and make it about what can we as fundraisers do specifically to advance a culture of equity, inclusion, and social justice. And so some of it was very obvious, like setting up, you know, funds and things like that and trying to put those in pitches instead of annual fund, but also be very intentional about hiring practices, um, the places that we're talking to, making sure that um, the staff that is BIPOC, you know, develop a public platform because nothing attracts candidates, diverse candidates like diverse leaders, you know. Um, our team is about 30% BIPOC, so that bucks the trend by a lot. I don't take any credit for that. I think that is where the historical values of the new school come into play. I also know I get a lot of candidates um, apply because they've seen our president, who's a gay black man, and he talks about it a lot in the media, his lived experience. That attracts candidates. Um, I've been told that, you know, because I'm a person of color, that has attracted them to apply. Um, so, yeah, that is that is work that's important to me. It's something I worry about. I was at an industry lunch not so long ago, and again, I was the only Asian person. And I was always, and I was asked repeatedly what my role was at the institution, even though it was a lunch for the people who were ahead of their department. So there's a lot of work to do um, in our field. And, you know, I, I wish I could say I knew the formula to, to do it. So, but, you know, part of why I wanted to do this podcast too, is to talk about it. And I think yeah. that's that's part of the work. So I'm, I'm thankful to you for making spaces for, for this kind of work to happen. No doubt. And I think, uh, you know, what has come up in a variety of conversations around this topic is if there is a sector that should be able to solve this problem, if there's a sector that has a unique competitive advantage in access to student talent, yeah, yeah. this is the sector. And when you walk through the traditional, you know, call centers historically that many advancement shops have, it looks a lot more diverse than yeah, yeah. that, you know, 140 person gathering you were describing. And so it's not like the raw materials aren't there, but it's really been the career pathway, the entry point. I know Case has done some work around their graduate trainee program, but it does feel like this is more solvable for this advancement sector than than just about any other sector. But to your point, it's not being solved. It's not. It's, it's almost getting worse. So I think all the things you talked about, you know, job descriptions being written poorly. Um, I think referrals are an issue too, because referrals are kind of like boards, right? We're self-selecting. We clone ourselves. This is human nature. We know who we know. Um, Another thing too, I think most people are not trained to interview well. 
I know I wasn't initially. I was interviewing people probably before I should have been. You know, I I did not know best practice. I was probably too conversational, relying on my gut, which how can I rely on my gut if I haven't really hired people before? So um, that's a big gap that's missing. Um, workplace climate, career growth, all that kind of stuff. I think I wouldn't have learned about the field of fundraising if I hadn't been adjacent to wealth. You know, I grew up very poor, but singing an opera puts you in spaces that are very wealthy. So I had a vague understanding that there were people around fundraising and that they had a job and it seemed to be very, <laughs> you know, uh, fulfilling. But if you are not adjacent to any of that, you wouldn't even know about it. Who are peers, if any, in the sector and, and maybe your professional network skews more heavy towards New York nonprofit broadly, just given your your yeah. historical um, kind of track record, or or maybe you plugged in in the advanced world. But do you have peers that you feel are aligned with you in in trying to do something about this? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it was one of the reasons um, I just joined the board of um, Association of Fundraising Professionals. I told them when they approached me, I said, "This is the one thing I want to work on." <laughs> if that's if that's okay with you, then sure. Um, but we're all busy people. And um, so I know there's our, our you know, the the trade uh, industry is is very interested in it. So I know there's people out there who want to chip away at this, but no, I am worried about it, you know. Um yeah, I mean, look, I think all all we can do, and I have seen some interesting um, uh, roles that have emerged in recent years where you can intentionally create entry-level roles where historically we might have said, if we want somebody in a frontline fundraising role, they need X, yeah. Y, set of experiences, which means you by default shrink the candidate pool to be people that have already done it, et cetera, thereby not creating that on-ramp or conduit for more diverse talent to enter the space. And so I think just having that, you know, junior gift officer role or that entry level role, maybe it's a development coordinator in some, in some institutions, but where we could, we could really go out to the student population and just be present, engage them as candidates and, and create a, create an on-ramp. I mean, I think those are the kinds of things that that everybody can do. We've got the the positions, and it's not like there's, uh, you know, it's pretty well known that there's kind of a talent crisis or shortage yeah, yeah, in yeah. our sector right now. So if there's ever a time to sort of fill some of those open seats, this this would be it. Call centers, like you said earlier, great source for talent and the competencies you want. An another area that I really love: membership desk associate membership desk. Uh, who are the student tour guides? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I one of my part-time jobs in grad school was at the MFA Boston, and I, my job was to sit in a little room and pretty much just take complaints all day in my face <laughs> from members who were not happy with this, that, or the other thing, and that was pretty good training, <laughs> you know, not that all my donors complained to me, but, but to be able to be empathetic and, and you know, still kind of... Um, persuade them that the value of their membership had meaning, all that stuff. Look, in the software world, there, there has absolutely been a track record for uh, if you want to eventually go be a product manager and work on fixing the product, start in support because you're going to get all the pain, all the challenges, all the frustrations like you did yeah. at the MFA. And that gives you really good empathy and understanding that you can then, you know, translate into future roles. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, we're going to pivot. We have to talk about baking it. I imagine ah. you love talking about it. Maybe maybe you're tired of talking about it, but what a unique, fun uh, opportunity. Set us up. Where were oh. you? How did you get that call? I know it wasn't from a recruiter. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't Lynn Dower and Associates. Yeah. Um, <laughs> for folks that are less familiar, but it just sounds yeah. amazing. So um, for those who don't know, Baking It is a reality TV show and is produced by Amy Poehler. And it's a sister show to her other show called Making It, which is a crafting competition. Um, the hosts, I was season, I was on season one. The hosts were Andy Samberg and Maya Rudolph. They just finished season two and it was Maya Rudolph again and Amy Poehler stepped into the role of hosting. The judges are four grandmas 
They are not culinary icons. They are gram literal grandmas who have lots of opinions about baking. And they're very good cooks, but that's that's the setup. Um, you're, the, the Before I did it, uh, my husband saw a little ad on Instagram that said, bakers and your helpers sign up to be on part of this um, new show. It did not say NBC. It looked like it was that crazy like papyrus font. It did not look professional. Um, so he just sent me the ad in you know Instagram and sent me the gif of Moira and um sorry Dan Levy's character in Shit's Creek fighting in the kitchen over folding in cheese and he just put a little you know laughing face. So I on my lunch break I looked at the form I made the video at my desk in about 3 minutes and said, "Hey, you know, I'm I'm a baker." Uh, I'm a diversity bingo card. I love reality TV. I can do the whole dead-eyed into camera one thing and say I didn't come here to make friends. Whatever you need. And then a couple hours later, a casting agent called and I thought this is a scam. I, I was very skeptical. I said, what company is doing this? They wouldn't tell me. They wouldn't tell me anything. Um, and so then from then for four months, I had to get screened by producers from like The Amazing Race, Big Brother, all the NBC properties. I had to showed them a portfolio of about 20 items I had made. And then I had to cook for them on nine different little videos. And then I had to do a Zoom against the final 18 teams. And then they chose uh, eight teams of us and we flew to LA and we filmed it. And the um, it's not like Top Chef. It's very uh, like a cozy blanket of a show. No one is there. They did not pick people who wanted to become famous. They did not pick people uh, again, with that, I didn't come here to make friends kind of mentality. They picked just kind of, other than me, quiet, <laughs> um, sort of self-deprecating people who just like to bake. And it was it was hilarious. I mean, it was uh, top three experiences in my life. It was so fun. And the, the cast, we text, I mean, we text every day. We literally text about 10 minutes ago um, because of something that funny that happened in the news. So... What a fun story. Amazing. So where do we go from here? Is there like now going to be a reunion? <laughs> I mean, don't share anything you can't share, but I mean. Sorry, wow. it's on, uh, yes, it is on, it is streaming both seasons on Peacock, which is NBC's property. I think you can watch some of it for free. But um, anyway, no, I just, weird things. Again, I don't want to be a baker. Talk about a tough job. I mean, horrible hours, no margin, you know, for profit or anything like that. Um, but weird things just keep popping up then because of that show. So, you know, I got to judge a gingerbread competition, which I have no business judging because my house, uh, as I said to one person who's interviewing me about it, it looked like a gay bar with no roof. It was supposed to be a Japanese temple, but it just, it was horrible. I only had four hours. Um, and then what else? Oh, a couple casting agents have reached out about something on the Food Network, but I, I, I didn't. It was about cookies and I, I don't really want to do that. <laughs> so I don't know. So the answer, the short answer is I don't know. Um, but, you know, I'm willing to do anything for a hundred bucks. Incredible that it literally emerged by way of an Instagram ad. I could probably go on a tirade about the importance of uh, digital marketing and digital media as part of a core advancement strategy, but I won't. We'll just <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, for you to have uh, what sounds like kind of a life-changing experience and an unforgettable memory. I love that. Yeah, very, very fun. Um, All right, we're going we're gonna to bring it home here. Um, tell me just about New School Today, what you're excited about. Are you hiring? I know you're connected with the Development Debrief, uh, you know, big fans uh, of Catherine and her work, uh, et cetera. Just, just tell me about kind of state of affairs. Uh, and, and then, of course, if folks want to get in touch, what's the best way to do that? Yes. So um, the first and most important thing you asked, we are absolutely hiring. We're hiring um, two frontliners right now for two of the colleges, and we'd love to see uh, applications. So you can go, you know, email me directly if you want, nij at newschool.edu. Um, so I'm very excited about that. Um, what am I excited about most? Um, I like that the things that we are working on happen to square directly with what philanthropists are most interested. So I kind of alluded to it before, but, you know, climate solutions, you know, healthy materials, um, that kind of work. 
and then very, very serious research about, you know, <laughs> the peril of democracy that is also on the minds of some of our um, most generous philanthropists in the world. So I like that we're working on those things at the exact same time. Um, and then I like, what I like about the New School, and I've said it before, is that I can have whiplash in one day. I can go from um, Fashion Week, because, you know, we have Parsons, to meeting with and having a very serious dinner with a Holocaust survivor who supports the New School for Social Research, which was the original school of the New School over 100 years ago. But I like that. I like that about the New School, that I don't have to live in one place. I don't think, I don't want to live in a, um, a zone that's dire all day. And I also don't want to live in a, a place that's just all about glamour one day. Uh, not that Parsons is, it has serious work. But yeah, so that's what keeps the job really interesting. And I think, um, and also the people. So that's that's what I'm most excited about. The leadership team at the new school um, is a rare configuration of people. We're almost exclusively BIPOC. Um, and it's it's kind of amazing to see in our field. I love it, Jonah, your um, kind of passion and commitment and, and alignment with with everything you've described is really inspiring. And I'm, I'm happy for you. And uh, sounds like a really good fit and, and look forward to being in touch and would encourage everybody to, to reach out to Jonah. He's active on, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Instagram, whatever your preferred, um, you know, method is, but, you know, part of what we hope happens with the podcast is that people listen and, and not only learn, but also connect because, you know, I'm sure you're all just a, a degree of separation or two away already. And, and so I hope you'll, uh, you'll make sure to reach out to Jonah. Yeah, and um, if you want to see the show, but you don't want to pay the four ninety nine or whatever it is, <laughs> you can go to TikTok. My TikTok too has a lot of clips from it. So um, there I'm we go. Not enough TikTok shout outs on the podcast. We yeah, gotta, gotta fresh it up a little bit. That's actually where I have the most activity. So. Okay, love it, love it. All right, Jonah. Well, look forward to being in touch uh, in in real life and uh, uh, on TikTok and beyond. And wish you the absolute best. And uh, for everybody listening, please uh, connect with Jonah. With that, I'm going to sign off, Brent, uh, with today's guest, Jonah Nye, who serves as Senior Vice President of Development and Alumni Engagement at the New School. Thanks, and take care, everybody. Thank you.